Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Sound Guy Barry. I was recently asked, should I use a active DI box or a passive DI box? Does it make any difference? I thought that was a good topic, so let's talk DI boxes. Now, a DI box is a direct input box, a little interface box like that, which allows you to plug a musical instrument directly into your PA system. And we use DI boxes for a number of reasons. If we have an acoustic instrument on stage, like your vocals or a drum kit, well, then we put a mic up in front of it to capture the sound, and the output of the mic produces a little bit of voltage that we send into the mixer. But if an instrument on stage already gives us a voltage output, an electronic output, like a keyboard, for example, or acoustic guitar, we can just put that signal into a direct box and connect a microphone line from the mixer to the output of the DI box and uh, pipe the signal directly into our sound system. And that's clean and clear and we don't get any kind of background noise like we would from a microphone. There's no possibility that that channel can easily feed back if we turn it up a lot because it's not going to hear noise from the speakers coming back into it like a microphone possibly could. And so a DI box is a great way to get a clean and clear signal off of a source. If I have a choice between miking an instrument and using a DI box, in most cases I'll lean toward the DI box because it gives me a better, cleaner signal to mix. Now of course in the case of guitar, electric guitars and their amplifiers, lots of times the sound of that amplifier or the sound of the speakers in that amplifier are an important part of a musician's tone. And if that's the case, then we mic the box. But if that's not super critically important, the advantages of DIing that uh, cabinet uh, would be compelling to me. And so my choice is to DI electric guitars if I can do it and everybody is okay with it. Now when you DI an electric guitar, you're going to get the full spectrum of that instrument. The lowest lows, the highest highs, it'll all be extremely clear and articulate. Whereas after it comes through the loudspeaker in the instrument amplifier, all of those deep lows are rolled out, the highs are rolled out, and it's a little softer sounding. So that means that I need to emulate some of that curve with my equalizer on the mixing board in order to make the guitar sound right. Guitar might sound a little brittle and overly bright if I don't knock down some of those extreme ends. But uh, oftentimes I feel like I'm pretty successful at being able to do that. Anyway number of reasons why we use DI boxes. One of them is that the DI box provides isolation between the equipment on stage and the PA sound system. There's a transformer inside of here that couples the signal that goes through the box. And so that means that the signal is coupled through the DI box magnetically. There isn't any hard electrical connection from the input side to the output side. So that provides some isolation between the gear on stage and the sound system. And if the gear on stage and the sound system are plugged into different power feeds, different power circuits, there's a possibility that there might be some low-level stray currents flowing back and forth between those different legs of the power circuits. And that kind of stuff could cause hum and noise and buzz in your signals. But if you use a DI box, it breaks that connection between the two pieces of equipment and just moves the signal through it magnetically. So that prevents us from getting hum and buzz and noise. So on the DI box, you'll usually find a switch labeled ground lift. And if you set that to lift, there will be no physical connection whatsoever between the stuff on stage and the mixing board. But of course, it still passes signal through it. Now, there have been cases where I've still got noise in that mode. And so then I might switch the thing over to ground position, which does tie the chassis grounds together between the instrument amplifiers and the PA system. And sometimes that works better. But usually, usually I'll be in ground lift mode. The other thing that the DI box does is that it has an attenuator switch on it. And so this allows us to reduce the signal level that gets transmitted through the DI. For example, if I plug this into a guitar amplifier's loudspeaker output, which is a pretty big signal, it's a lot more energy in that signal than what I would normally get off of a microphone on stage, I wouldn't want to send a signal of that magnitude into the mixing board and possibly overload that channel on the mixer and have that channel distort. And so you can apply the attenuator to knock the signal level down so when it gets back into your mixing board, it's at a reasonable 
level for you to mix and work with. And uh, you don't overload the preamps of your mixing board. And the most important reason why we use the DI box, and the reason why you can't usually just plug your musical instrument gear directly into the sound mixer, is because the signals are a little different. The signals that we use coming off of a standard microphone are low impedance and balanced. Balanced meaning it's got a three pin connection, it's got a ground and two signal lines, whereas the uh, connection that comes off of, for example, an electric guitar is uh, more like one of these guys, which is a quarter inch phone plug, which has just got ground and signal. By using two signal lines in a balanced connection, we can have one signal being in standard polarity, the other one being inverted, and this is interpreted back at the mixer in its preamps. And so by doing that, if that signal wire from the stage back down to your mixer picks up some kind of electrical interference in the environment, maybe it passes near some power lines or it uh, picks up some hum and buzz off of the lighting controllers or something like that, that hum and buzz and noise gets imparted into the cable in a way that's pretty much equal on all of the wires. Whereas the valuable signal that we want that's coming off of your instrument is being placed on those wires in a inverted and not inverted mode. And because of that, the mixer is able to differentiate between the hum and buzz and noise and the good signal that we want. And it's able to reject the hum and buzz and noise. And that's one of the reasons why professional microphones using three pin connectors can travel distances of 100 or 200 feet away from the mixer on a long piece of cable without getting too terribly noisy. Whereas cable like guitar cable can usually only go 10 to 20 feet before you get into an issue with the possibility of picking up hum and buzz and noise with the cable. The other thing is that microphones Professional microphones using balanced connections are also low impedance, whereas guitars and a lot of other musical gear uses high impedance connections. Now, when I say impedance, it means to impede or to block or to hold back. And so it's a reference to how easily power will flow from one side to another. So we have a power source, which would be the microphone, and a, <clears throat> and a load, which would be the mixer. Or a power source might be your guitar, which is putting out a little bit of voltage, and its load is the guitar amplifier. And the load could either be a heavy load or a light load on the source. For example, let's imagine this battery is a power source. Instead of a microphone or a guitar, all these things put out some voltage. So let's just imagine a battery for a set, for an example. A little AA battery. I could put this battery into a small digital clock. And how long would the clock run? probably quite a while, a few weeks, maybe a couple months. So the clock is hardly drawing any power at all out of this battery. If I was to measure the battery just right here, it'd be about one and a half volts. If I put it into the clock and measured it, it would still be really close to one and a half volts. It'd be very, very slightly less because the clock is drawing a little bit of juice out of it, but not much. And so that would be a pretty high impedance situation because the clock is not drawing any real energy out of the battery. It's impeding the flow of energy from the battery. It doesn't need much. It's um, just very lightly sipping it. And with a high impedance connection, the voltage drop is very little because you're not making it work very hard. Now, on the other hand, I could take this battery and I could put it into a high power flashlight. And then, then how long would it last? Maybe an hour or two? Not very long. And that's because the flashlight's drawing a lot of energy out of the battery. And if I was to do that, I was, if I was to measure the battery, it's about one and a half volts right here. And if I put it in the flashlight and I could measure it while the flashlight's running, the voltage would be less because it's just really working this thing hard. It's draining a lot of energy out of it. And so that would be a low impedance connection because it's not impeding the flow of power. It's taking a lot of power. So it's not impeded. It's low impedance. And so that's kind of the difference between a high impedance connection and a low impedance connection. So a guitar amplifier is a high impedance input, meaning the guitar amplifier doesn't put hardly any load at all on the guitar. It just 
very lightly senses what the uh, signal of the guitar cable is. Whereas a PA sound system mixer is a low impedance connection, meaning it actually requires the microphone to drive the signal down the cable and into it with a little bit of juice. And now I'm not talking like jump-starting a truck kind of juice, but it does require a little bit of energy out of the microphone to, if you will, physically push that stuff down the wire into the mixing board. And so the mixing board applies a little bit of load onto those mics. And one of the reasons that it does this is, again, to reduce the hum and noise that's picked up. Because if it takes a little bit of force to push the signal down the wire, and then you have interference coming into the side of the wire, which is really of extremely low energy, that interference isn't really strong enough to make much of an impact on the signal if it's a low impedance source. Now, if it's high impedance, like a guitar amp, that's just really lightly sensing the signal, and any little stray signals that come in, they'll be picked up just as well also. So that's why we use low impedance connections, is to uh, try to reduce the hum and noise. But in order to plug a high impedance source, like your guitar, into a low impedance input, we need to go through a direct box that makes that conversion for us. Otherwise, if we were to plug a guitar, which is a high impedance instrument, in directly into a low impedance load, like your mixer, it would just damp out the guitar. The voltage that would be normally riding on the guitar wire would just drop way down because it just doesn't have the energy to push that kind of load and it would probably change the character of the guitar tone. It might cut a lot of highs out of it. It just wouldn't sound so good. So that's the reason why we need to use the DI box, because we take the musical instrument signal in on one side, which is high impedance, and of course this is just jumpered through. Both those are the same thing. And it puts it out on the back side in balanced low impedance that can drive a long cable. So the question is, What's the better DI box? A passive DI box or the active DI box? Well, they both do the same function. And in practical terms, they're pretty darn interchangeable. But they both have their advantages, and I guess some disadvantages. The passive DI box is a really simple device. All that's in here is a little transformer and some resistors to do the attenuation, and that's about it. It's um, not got a lot of stuff in there, so it's going to be really reliable. There isn't much to break. I mean, I guess you could mechanically break the box, but you're not going to have an electronic circuit failure with a passive DI. The downside of the passive DI is that the transformer that's in here has to actually push all of the, the energy of the signal through it and down the cable, and it is coupling the loads from the mixer side and the instrument side more or less directly. And so the quality of that transformer actually matters a little bit. Some are better than others. And they can have some impact on the behavior of the instrument because although it's a high impedance source, and it is, it's still going to put a little bit of load on your guitar or whatever you're plugged into here with. And so some instruments that are load sensitive may actually have some minor tone character changes depending upon the DI box that you use. Now, if you're using an instrument that has an electronic output stage, like maybe a keyboard, uh, that's probably got plenty of juice to just push on through this and not be very affected by it at all. But if you're using a guitar with passive pickups, that's a pretty delicate instrument, if you will, and the load probably matters. And so different DI boxes may impact the tone of your guitar a little bit. Um, but... Like I say, passive DI boxes are very reliable. There isn't much to break, so uh, that's good. Then we have active DI boxes, which, of course, do exactly the same thing as a passive DI box. They have the same controls on them for lifting ground and uh, attenuation and such. And uh, they also have a transformer that decouples the input instrument from the output that's going to your sound system. But after the transformer, they have active electronics. They have a little amplifier module in here that pushes that signal on down the line. And so the advantage of that is that on the input side, it doesn't need any push at all to make things happen. It's kind of like a guitar amplifier. Only a very minuscule amount of signal can drive an active DI box. 
And so because of that, the active DI box should put even less load on your instrument and um, should allow your instrument to perform at its maximum potential. Now again, if you're using something like a keyboard or other electronic piece of equipment that has you know, a powered output stage to it, it can probably push through a passive DI box without problems. But if you have an instrument that is somewhat load sensitive, the active DI will um, treat it better and you'll get a more pure sound. On the back side, the uh, active DI box has its own amplification for pushing the signal on down the line. So you should get clean, clear, strong signal out of an active DI box, even on long cable runs. Whereas with the passive DI box, all of the energy to push that signal all the way down the wire to your mixer is actually coming from the instrument itself. Whereas with the active box, it's got an amplifier in there to assist, so you can make sure that you always get strong, clear signal from the active DI, even on long cable runs from the stage. Now, the downside with the active DI box is that it uh, it's active. It requires power. There's electronic circuitry in here that needs some juice. And so you'll find that there's a battery compartment where you can put a battery in. This guy, this one takes a 9-volt battery. And of course, when the battery dies, so does the DI. So that's an issue. Of course, a lot of these boxes, including this one, will also run off of phantom power, which is, of course, what I would choose to do because I don't like to worry about having batteries fail on me in the show. And so you could plug this into an input on your mixer and en enable phantom power in that channel to uh, provide power to operate this DI box. The other thing that active DI boxes can do is since there's active electronics in here, some of these DI boxes have the ability to do some tone control. And uh, this one in particular is a Ultra G box by Behringer. Um, they also make a silver version of it, which is a straight, pure DI box. But the Ultra G version, the red one, is made to pick up guitars. And so there's a switch here that switches it between just a standard, pure DI box that just passes a signal straight through it, nice and clean. Or you can engage the switch, which is labeled Virtual 4x12 Cab speaker simulator. It's just an equalizer that cuts out the highs and, and lows, puts a little dip in the mids. But by engaging that guy, you can change the tone that comes through this box to make it sound kind of more or less like a uh, guitar amplifier loudspeaker. And so this actually works quite well, I found, in my situation, where I plug this box into the loudspeaker output of a guitar amplifier and now normally it would sound kind of harsh and brittle because I'm just getting pure electrical signal. I'm not getting that smoothness that's being offered by the guitar amp. And then you can engage this filter here, the virtual 4x12 cab filter, and it smooths this thing out. And it sounds a lot more realistic, like right, signals coming off of a real guitar amp. And um, I've had really good luck with these. They're about 30 bucks. So a uh, great way to pick up your guitars on stage electronically without the use of microphones. And I find when I do that, I get really clean and clear guitar tone. I can get that just a little bit of extra edginess in the guitar that helps me push it up through the mix and make it so everybody can be heard real articulate. So hopefully that answered some of your questions about DI boxes. Um, like I say, passive, active DI boxes, they do the same thing. They can be used pretty interchangeably. If I have a choice, in most cases, I'll reach for the active DI box because it has a stronger ability to drive the cable and it has less impact on the instrument that it's plugged into. But there is the reliability issues, which is there's active electronics in here, and that's a little more stuff that could possibly fail, and it needs power. But um, other than that, either DI box should work well for you. Love to hear your comments, questions, suggestions. If you have them, feel free to put them down below. Hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you enjoyed the episode enough to smash the like button and uh, hit the subscribe button. Share it with your friends. Um, thanks for stopping by, folks. I'll catch you again on another episode of Sound Advice. And uh, once again, my name is Barry. I'm a sound engineer in the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities area. If you need help with sound or you need some advice, I'd be glad to help you out. Really appreciate you watching the series, and I invite you to watch more. So until next time, be good, have great shows, and uh, good luck.